Hey everybody, welcome back to the Whiteboard Doctor. I'm your host for today. I appreciate you tuning in. Um, if this is the first time you've been to the channel, welcome. If you have been here a number of times, welcome back. Today we're going to talk about furosemide or Lasix. So I drew out a little picture here already to save us some time, and we'll dive into that picture in a bit. But initially I just wanted to talk generally about Lasix. So Lasix is a loop diuretic. What that means is that it acts on the loop of Henle in the nephron, which is drawn below. It is not the only diuretic. We also have torsamide and budesonide, which are both loop diuretics as well. But today we'll just be talking about Lasix. Oral Lasix and IV Lasix have a different onset of action, peak bioavailability, et cetera, et cetera, because the oral bioavailability, so PO Lasix bioavailability, is highly variable. So anywhere from 10 to 90% of oral Lasix becomes bioavailable after taking it, and it's based on a number of different reasons. So when talking about PO Lasix and the bioavailability, it has to be understood that 95% of Lasix is protein bound. This is important because these protein bound furosemide molecules get into the proximal convoluted tubule through organic acid transporters. And once they're in the proximal convoluted tubule, about 50% of them are excreted protein bound whereas the rest are actually degraded through glucuronidase. But 95% are protein bound, and thus albumin can affect the amount of a bioavailability. So one thing that affects bioavailability is albumin. If you're hypoalbuminemic and you have less protein to make Lasix protein bound, you will have less protein bound Lasix getting into the proximal convoluted tubule to do its job. In addition to that, uh, furosemide has to be transported into the proximal convoluted tubule to then get to the loop of Henle to do its job. So the second thing that can affect it is renal function, right? Because if your kidney, if you have CKD or an AKI and your kidney is not functioning properly, you're not going to be able to get that furosemide to where it needs to go to do its job. In addition to that, the absorption, the GI absorption of furosemide can be decreased in patients who have significant edema because they can get GI edema or bowel edema and thus absorb less Lasix and then you took all this oral Lasix but did not absorb all of it and thus you do not have that full PO Lasix load to do its job. So. Variable bioavailability, 10 to 90% of PO Lasix. IV Lasix, the traditional teaching is that IV Lasix is two times as potent as PO Lasix. This, though, is based on this highly variable bioavailability. They say, hey, 10 to 90% bioavailable, let's just say it's about two times as potent. So this is actually somewhat of a misnomer. Honestly, I still use it in clinical practice, but... Um, it's a rough estimate. It is not a firm rule. Okay, so you took some IV Lasix because you don't want this highly variable bioavailability in one of your acutely ill patients. IV Lasix, the diuresis starts usually within about 30 minutes. I'm just going to draw this arrow of IV over here so you know what I'm talking about. The peak is about two hours and it lasts for about six to eight hours. This though is under the assumption that you have reached the threshold. What I mean by the threshold is I'm gonna draw a little graph here. So there is a dose threshold that you have to hit. I'm gonna do T for threshold for Lasix to have an effect. And once you hit that threshold, you will get an exponential diuretic effect, but your dose of Lasix, even if it comes right up close to the threshold, you will still get no diuresis. So in order 
to get diuresis, you have to hit this threshold, and then you will, so this above here is diuresis. Below is no. So this one could be a dose of, let's say, 20 milligrams IV, and you didn't hit the threshold. This could literally be a dose, and no one doses Lasix this way, but for the sake of point, 25 milligrams, and because you got just above that threshold, now you're getting your diuresis, whereas at 20 milligrams, you might not have gotten any diuresis. So in order to get these effects, you have to make sure the dose, it's the threshold to cause diuresis. In a patient who you give 20 milligrams of IV Lasix to, and they have no diuresis, giving them another 20 milligrams is not going to do anything because they did not hit the threshold. You have to increase the dose to make sure that they get past this threshold, and diuresis will then persist. Good. So I am going to delete all this to the right. I'm going to erase it because I want to free up some space, and we will continue talking. The next thing I wanted to talk about before we dive into the mechanism of action is the adverse effects. And I'm going to leave the adverse effects over here to the right of our drawing because we can actually talk about all the adverse electrolyte effects based on the mechanism of action and it helps to kind of understand things. So let me just get my uh, pen back out here. Okay, so adverse effects of Lasix are electrolyte and the different electrolyte adverse effects are hypo, natremia, kalemia, magnesemia, and calcemia. Additional adverse effects are hyperuricemia. It is actually a sulfonamide, so you can get acute interstitial nephritis or hypersensitivity. And you can also get sensitivity, sensitivity, there we go. And you can also get ototoxicity. This is often reversible though. Good. So I wanted to leave electrolytes underlined because we're going to use these to help understand the mechanism of action of Lasix. So as I said, furosemide or Lasix is a loop diuretic. This drawing here is just part of a nephron. So the part we are talking about, we have the proximal convoluted tubule, it goes into the loop of Henle, and you have the descending portion of the loop of Henle and the ascending portion into the proximal portion of the distal convoluted tubule. The other things I have here in green are um, osomes. So within the tubule, coming out of the proximal convoluted tubule, you essentially, I'm going to use the terms reabsorb for molecules going from the tubule into the interstitium because once they're in the interstitium, they are reabsorbed into the bloodstream. So within the proximal convoluted tubule, you already reabsorbed a large portion of your sodium, of your chloride, of your potassium, of your mag, almost all of your glucose, amino acids, bicarb, and more. So we're not going to focus on this because that's not what the lecture is about, but I just wanted to make a point. So what is coming through your tubule is a smaller percentage of all these molecules, including sodium, chloride, mag, potassium, calcium. In the interstitium, you have this gradient of osms because as you are traveling, you are reabsorbing all of these salts and because of that, as you go more distal into the descending loop of Henle, you have an increased osmolarity of the interstitium, which means that while the intertubular osms are 300 and the external osms in the interstitium are 900, that's when you're going to get all your H2O. So I know I drew that by the salts, but this is H2O. 
but that means that as you travel down the tubule, you actually are increasing your tonicity because all your H2O is going from the tubule to the interstitium. And once you get to the ascending loop of Henle, you are actually hypertonic. What that now means is that there is a push towards reabsorbing more of your salts, and that's where we get to our sodium potassium chloride transporter in the ascending loop of Henle. This is where furosemide acts. So there's a transporter that moves sodium, potassium, and 2-chloride from the tubule out into the interstitium. And by doing so, creates a gradient where potassium, actually a percentage of it, will go back into the tubule. And that creates a positive charge on the basal lateral membrane of some of these cells, which then leads to a passive, remember reabsorption is out into the interstitium, of calcium and magnesium that are positively charged ions. So what this transporter does, the sodium potassium dichloride transporter, is it causes sodium chloride potassium, calcium, and magnesium, all to end up in the interstitium. So when furosemide comes in and inhibits this, what it is doing is decreasing the amount of osms that can be in the interstitium, right? Because all of these salts here even though it's not, oh, sorry about that, even though it doesn't show them going over here, they're all over here as well, causing this gradient of osms. So without the sodium, potassium, chloride, calcium, magnesium, there is going to be lower osms in the interstitium, which then means there's going to be a smaller gradient for water, H2O, to follow. So that means is that the tub tubules are retaining more water. This is less hypertonic. And what you're delivering to the distal convoluted tubule has significantly more water in it. In addition to that, and remember that the distal convoluted tubule goes into eventually the collecting duct, I'm just new CD, and eventually this is what is excreted. So in addition to that, the tubule is going to have more sodium, potassium, chloride, calcium, and mag, because you're inhibiting this mechanism. So you're going to have increased excretion of water, calcium, sodium, potassium, and mag. Does that look familiar? Exactly. So the adverse effects of hyponatremia, kalemia, magnesemia, and calcemia are all because you're inhibiting the sodium, potassium, chloride transporter. Thus, there's less sodium and chloride in the interstitium, more in the tubule to be excreted. In addition to that, you have less potassium diffusing back across the membrane, leading to this positive basal cell charge that drives the uh, passive diffusion of calcium and magnesium into the interstitium. So those all stay in the tubule as well. And the Tubule contents, including the sodium, potassium, chloride, calcium, magnesium, as well as more H2O, are all excreted, which obviously you want the H2O excreted because that's the goal, but then you also get the adverse effects of electrolyte abnormalities such as those. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. Obviously, uh, nephrology and the uh, nephron is an extremely complex uh, beast. We could talk more about the different parts and even just the general physiology if you guys are interested. Leave any questions in the comments, leave any thoughts, and leave any additional videos you want us to make. But I will you know, think about making more videos just on the general physiology of the nephron if people are interested in that. And we can talk more about Lasix if people have additional questions. So if you found some value in this, feel free to subscribe. We're trying to get videos out every week, and they're on a diverse set of topics. So you guys drive the content here. Leave us comments, leave us questions, and we will make some videos about them. I appreciate your viewing.
and hope you all have a good day.